I want to uh, thank everybody who's joining us online today. Um, welcome to our the online component of BEMA's Dog Ear Festival, a, a celebration of artist books. My name is Ken Matsudaira. I'm the Director of Community and Cultural Programs here at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And I'm going to be introducing our moderator in just a second. But before we get started, we're just going to pause for a second to acknowledge that the history of the land that we stand upon before colonization, this was the home of the sovereign people of the Suquamish or the Suquab Nation, for those of us who are on Bainbridge Island right now. We acknowledge with gratitude their past and present stewardship of the, and preservation of the lands and waters that surround us. And we also acknowledge our history of colonialism and pay respect to their elders, both past and present, as they continue to live and protect the land and their culture for future generations. Um, I want to also thank our sponsors, Prism Cultural Programs, the City of Bainbridge Island, Kitsap County, Stoll Reeves, Laird Norton, Amos, uh, the Ames Family Foundation, and Leslie and Michael LeBeau. Uh, for those of you who are joining us by Zoom, you can go ahead and post questions to the panelists by using the Q&A buttons adjacent to the chat uh, icon on your Zoom controls. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to announce uh, to introduce tonight's moderator, Associate Director of the Cynthia Shears Book Artist Book Collection and primary organizer of this year's Dog Ear Festival, Ms. Catherine Alice Michaels. Thank you, Ken. Thank you to all in attendance in person on Zoom and in person in the audience here at the Frank Buxton Auditorium at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. The three artists invited here tonight are all people whose work I admire very much. I am in awe to have them all here together, at least virtually. They are printmakers, activists, and community members who hold others together and up with pride sometimes fierceness, other times joy, but always with what translates to me as a, uh, as a profound love for those in their community. Their circles of community seem both vast and specific to include people who identify as queer, trans, and or BIPOC, and also communities of printmakers, letterpress printers, educators, as well as the neighborhoods and towns they live in. Many times these communities overlap, which is how I came to meet all three. Ben Blunt is a Detroit born artist, designer and letterpress printer that loves books, type and putting ink on paper. Quincy's gonna put his website in the chat for you. His work often explores questions of race and identity and the stories we tell ourselves about living in America. Ben is a believer in the power of the printed word and shares his passion for print and design speaking to students and educators around the country. His artist books and prints are included in numerous collections, including the Joan Flash Collection at the School of Art Institute of Chicago, the Newberry Library and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Ben prints out of his storefront studio in Evanston, Illinois, West Village neighborhood. We're fortunate to have several of Ben's works in the collection, including his title, You Could End More Gracefully, a specimen book, which was featured in Artist Books Unshelved episode titled, What's Your Typeface? You can find the episode on Bema's YouTube channel. Welcome, Ben. Now I wanna introduce Kitty Koppelman. She is a self-taught print artist working in Olympia. We're gonna put her website in the chat as well. She combines line of cut images and letterpress words to convey optimistic left-leaning ideas. She teaches locally around the Puget Sound and is an integral member of the printmaking community in Olympia. One of the things Kitty writes about herself on her website is this. There are stories to be told in the color, light, depth, and richness surrounding me. In my routine of life, I'm way too unfocused and stingy with my attention to recognize these miracles as they come and go. In my work, I'm attempting to refocus my observation enough to see and to show how thrilling the breadth of reality can be. Welcome, Kitty. And Caden Henningsen. 
He's the owner of Meanwhile Letterpress, a trans-owned letterpress collaborative resisting erasure through the power of print. He is also a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, where he studies 19th century American literature, print culture, and transgender studies. His artist book, Marianne Waters is a Free Black Woman, is currently on display in the Boundless exhibit upstairs here at BIMA, a work we're fortunate to have in the collection, as well as two broadsides as part of Troubling, artist books that enlighten and disrupt old ways of being and seeing, an exhibit within Boundless curated by Tia Blassingame and Ellen Sheffield. Welcome, Caden. Yay. Everyone's clapping. We've asked each of our panelists to introduce you to their work through a short presentation of slides. So I'll briefly introduce each separately again, and we'll, uh, beginning with Caden, and we'll take questions at the very end of all three presenters. Um, when the pandemic first began to take hold in the Pacific Northwest, March of 2020, I began printing cards I could mail weekly to friends and strangers. This was part connection, part let's save the post office, part keeping myself from being crushed with fear and worry. It turned out that many other letterpress printers were doing the same or similar kind of mail art. Caden was one of the first I discovered whose print mail I had to have. And I reached out to ask if I could swap mail with him. I then went to Caden's website and discovered so much support for trans lives in his shop store. My favorite is a broadside that says, hello, transom. I laughed and bought several things for the trans people in my life. Caden won me over immediately with his humor and wordplay. Like everyone on the panel, there is a great deal of seriousness to the work Caden is doing. Besides celebrating trans lives today, he is bringing trans lives out from the far reaches of history and giving them dignity. Thank you for being here tonight, Caden. We turn it over to you now. Great, thank you so much for um, that very generous uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna try to uh, multitask and talk through some of my work while also uh, petting my dog Arlo, who is insisting on attention at this very moment. Okay. Has not learned Zoom etiquette yet. Um, so let me share my screen get into presentation mode. All right, so uh, the work that I do is uh, through um, my letterpress shop called Meanwhile Letterpress. Uh, and it started originally uh, in 2018 as a response to um, a memo that was going through the uh, Trump administration at the time that was really uh, narrowly defining uh, sex and gender in such a way that um, it really sought to eradicate and erase the existence of both um, trans and intersex people. And at the time I had been taking a, a class on bookmaking and, and printing through the University of Illinois. And um, a, a friend of mine and I decided we needed to uh, speak to this moment. Um, and so we printed these uh, broadsides with this simple sort of poetic um, statement, I, you, we exist. Uh, and we just, we printed them for free and gave them out to as many people as we could and got them out as quickly as possible all over the US, mailing them to people and distributing them at the local LGBT campus center and the campus, the LGBT campus center, um, the campus center and the community center, the UP Center, which is the LGBT community center in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and from there, I just was sort of like, you know, I think that there should be a, a letterpress shop that's really focused on uh, producing work fo uh, for, by, and about um, the trans and queer community. And I've since then have been very lucky to discover other uh, queer and trans artists who are also working in, in printmaking and letterpress. Um, so, I, uh, you know, I'm not alone in this endeavor. Uh, but that was sort of the launch in 2018. And uh, we we printed some posters, uh, a sort of a second edition of this IU We Exist print uh, and raised money to buy a print shop um, from a guy that was retiring. And that's sort of uh, how we started. I moved, uh, I moved to Chandler and Price 
press from three hours away in Galesburg, Illinois, and moved into an old IGA grocery store um, just south of Champaign. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's how we started. And from there, I've been printing work for the um, trans community that's often informed by um, some of my historical research. Um, and then also doing collaborative work with other, uh, other trans and queer artists. Uh, my particular interest is working uh, with poets. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to overview uh, some of some of the work that I've been doing, and I'm going to end talking about the broadsides and the artist book that are currently uh, on exhibit right now. Um, uh, and so, as uh, Catherine said, I am very fond of puns uh, and wordplay, and and some of that work is historically researched. And a, a colleague of mine was doing research on the history of. Uh, the prefix trans, um, and uh, Dr. Gamble is an early modernist working uh, sort of on uh, gender and sexuality in Shakespeare and had come across this early modern word transfisticate, which means to smash with your fist. Um, and so I wanted to uh, use that word and pun on system with the, with the um, prefix CIS, meaning on the same side of, uh, so, I'm reluctant to say in opposition to trans, but is often thought of as sort of non-trans people whose identity is uh, in congruence with the sex assigned to them at birth. And so I just did a simple line of cut of my own fist and uh, worked with the type to give it a semblance of being uh, smashed down uh, in the printing process. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with um, uh, Chicago-based trans poet H. Melt uh, for their new collection of poems that just came out this fall called There Are Trans People Here. Uh, and it's a phenomenal collection. I, I highly recommend it. And uh, H. Mel, Mel reached out to me. I had sent them some bookmarks a few years ago that just said, read trans poets. Uh, and H. Melt asked for a, a limited edition broadside as a sort of promotional thing to give to people who pre-ordered uh, the collection of poems. And so I just did a simple uh, design that said, read trans poets. Uh, and then I perforated the bottom uh, so you could actually tear away uh, and still have uh, sort of the original uh, or close to the original bookmark that I had made uh, a few years prior that reads um, uh, read trans poets. And so this was my first um, collaborative project uh, with um, uh, with trans poets. I'm currently working on another broadside for the uh, online journal uh, Smoke and Mold. And that broadside, broadside should hopefully uh, be out later this summer. Um, I, was in, I was invited uh, by the university to participate in a project. They uh, launched um, a retrospective of the work of Hal Fisher, famous uh, queer artist. Uh, and as part of that exhibition, uh, the literary journal on campus Ninth Letter held a, a poetry competition uh, uh, for poems inspired by the work of uh, Fisher and specifically um, his work on gay semiotics. Uh, and part of that um, uh, competition, they approached me and asked me to print two broadsides, one of the winning poem and one of the honorable mention, also influenced by this work by Hal Fisher. Uh, both poems incorporate um, Fisher's um, reference to uh, hankies and the, uh, the gay hanky code. Uh, and so for those broadsides, we present, uh, we, I printed um, uh, two uh, handkerchiefs, uh, one, uh, one red and one navy blue, uh, featuring the two, uh, the two poems that are now part of the, um, the Fisher retrospective. Uh, I then started thinking, one of the things when I'm not doing work for specific people is I'm thinking about what it means to be uh, a queer trans person in um, central Illinois and work in a studio that's in a much smaller town south of Champaign in a slightly more rural setting uh, and what that, um, what that means for me personally and what it means to make work um, about being queer and trans in the, um, 
in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest in a town of 450 people. So I'm very um, invested in thinking about sort of rural queer lives. Uh, and my studio is situated uh, near some train tracks and some grain elevators. And so uh, I can look out um, my, uh, my door when it's open and hear the train go by and see the green elevators. And so for this print that was uh, printed in part for partners in print in Seattle as part of their celebrating all types um, portfolio, uh, I took the green elevators and put a telescope effect and a telescope I'm really interested in also as a queer object. Uh, it is like a kaleidoscope where a kaleidoscope uses little bits of glass to create um, designs that change. The kaleidoscope uses a prism that allows you to create a kaleidoscope effect of the natural world. Uh, and the title, the kaleidoscope was invented um, by John Burnside and Harry Hay, who are famous uh, gay activists in Los Angeles uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and so I, I wanted to do that telescope effect of the grain elevators as a sort of central um, sort of touchstone of my studio space, and then played with the um, various collections of wood type uh, that I had to sort of get this uh, rural queer uh, print. Um, uh, the other portfolio that I've been uh, very excited to be a part of was a, a portfolio put together um, by Blackbird Press um, uh, called the Inspiring Women Portfolio that featured uh, prints about um, inspiring women in celebration of the anniversary of women's right to vote. Uh, and this is where some of my more historical research really starts to come in. Uh, for that portfolio, I wanted to do a print in honor of Sylvia Rivera, um, a Latina trans woman who was instrumental in the start of the uh, gay liberation movement. Um, and she, in 1973, gave this very, uh, at least within the queer community, famous speech uh, addressing a sort of one of the first um, gay liberation pride events. Uh, and the, the audience didn't want to hear her speak. They were yelling and booing at her. And she famously yells at them, you all better quiet down. And so for this portfolio, I printed her speech in its entirety with this um, large type uh, uh, Cooper Black. Um, it was a, a, a favorite typeface of mine. Uh, but I started thinking about the sort of um, the cl some class issues around letterpress as a fine printing and um, its accessibility uh, to people um, of lower socioeconomic status. Uh, and letterpress is probably not something that um, Sylvia Rivera would have worked with. Um, so I see my dog ripping up a paper. Uh, but she would have worked with um, perhaps mimeograph machines or ditto machines in a kind of reproductive way. So part of my goal was to actually let the printing have some of that slurriness and messiness of a kind of reproductive process of the ditto machine, the mimeograph, or a Xerox machine. Uh, and I started thinking about the kind of noise that that visually creates. And so I was trying in this print to think about the kind of visual noise of the sort of slippery type um, it's not 100% locked in tight. I wanted it to move around and create some slippery, slipperiness. Uh, and so the, the catchphrase of hers, y'all better quiet down, really has to work against the, course, the sort of noise that's happening within the, um, the body text of the, of the talk. Um, and so I'm trying to think through the, the history of printing practice and printing technologies and its relationship to the way that we communicate um, uh, in various sort of historical periods. I work predominantly in the 19th century for my own research, but I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, printing practices uh, over time. 
Uh, and that takes us to the work that is uh, currently on exhibit. Um, I, there are two broadsides available in the exhibition that is um, uh, curated by Tia Blassingame and Ellen Sheffield. Uh, and these prints are both rooted uh, deep, deep, deep in the archive uh, and trying to think of a sort of like the laminating effect of history uh, and the way that details come out and uh, the the broadside on the left is uh, calling herself Eleanor. It's based on a, um, a, a late 14th century uh, criminal case invo involving Eleanor Reichner, who is a trans woman who was arrested uh, for sex work in London. It's the first documented case of sodomy uh, in uh, London archives. And it's a fascinating uh, case. It's a sort of deposition of Eleanor uh, that really tries to lock her into a particular kind of identity that she consistently resists in the actual uh, document itself, where she consistently says that she goes by Eleanor and she talks about her history. Um, uh, working not only as a sex worker, but working as a seamstress um, and is a, a, like a barmaid, uh, that sort of thing. And so for this print, I've I've uh, layered a, a map of London from the actual period. You can see sort of like around the L and one of the L's and calling a Sopper's Lane where she was arrested. Um, and then over that, so the map is in blue and then in pink is the actual Latin um, court record. And then from that, I've pulled out the sort of prominent evidence that I think, in addition to all of the labored, uh, uh, gendered labor that she does as a sex worker and as a seamstress, uh, repeatedly she um, insists that her name is Eleanor. And so we have this um, moment uh, of her calling herself Eleanor. Uh, likewise, in the right is a historical document from, uh, from the early American archive in Virginia about an intersex figure, uh, Thomasine Hall. Uh, and they, uh, folks in the town would see um, Hall going out, um, sometimes in women's clothing, sometimes in men's clothing, and it uh, created a bit of a stir. And so Hall was brought before the court uh, and interrogated quite heavily, both by the legal uh, uh, the legal court and also the medical um, sort of powers that be in town. Uh, and so, uh, within that um, record, there are these moments where Hall really resists a particular kind of positioning. Uh, so when they ask, you know, why. Uh, why do you go out in women's clothes? Hall responds, I go out in women's peril to get a bit for my cat. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to buy cat food, uh, right? Um, and at times, uh, answers that, uh, that Hall is uh, both a man and a woman. Like, Hall really refuses to be positioned in any sort of way. Uh, the legal apparatus of the court document really tries to contain Hall, but embedded within that are these moments that really uh, resist that kind of uh, containment, similar to Eleanor. So thinking about containment and the sort of legal apparatus and the way that print tries to contain uh, identities, uh, that's where my artist book, um, Mary Ann Waters is a Free Black Woman comes in. Uh, and I wanna preface by saying that this work um, is also inspired um, uh, visually and theoretically by the work of Glenn Ligon, um, especially uh, his piece entitled, I Feel Most Colored When Thrown Against a Sharp White Background, uh, that really is about the relationship between language and legibility and illegibility and identity. Uh, and the work of M. Naborse Philip, uh, who is a poet, um, who has this amazing collection of poems uh, based on the archival evidence around um, the tragic story of uh, the slaving ship Zong. Um, 
and she just has this amazing way of working with a mode of redaction that creates this watery effect uh, and reference to the middle passage on the page uh, that I um, am really sort of thinking about as I put my artist book together. And so, um, uh, the artist book is a, is a flip book. It features a, a pickup notice, is a form of uh, slaving literature from the Daily um, National Intelligencer uh, in 1851. And this notice is about someone named Marianne Waters, uh, who has been apprehended uh, by the Baltimore police. Um, and there's a lot of information about Waters that uh, tries to offer a counter narrative than what Waters is actually giving uh, uh, to uh, the warden of the Baltimore County Jail. Um, so they, like a lot of pickup notices and fugitive slave ads, there's a lot of information about her comportment and uh, the clothes that she is wearing, but she makes it very clear uh, that she, that um, her name is Marianne Waters, similar to Eleanor Reichner, um, uh, that she has been hiring out as a woman in Baltimore. So she's been engaged in sex work and there's a description of the, um, the clothes that she's wearing. And she also is very clear uh, in that she is free. Um, but the, the apparatus of the, the ad or the pickup notice tries to really disrupt that and, co and correct it or present a different sort of narrative. So what I've done is um, using sort of a, 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 an idea of redaction that's theorized by scholar Christina Sharp, which is about redacting the text in order to make the, um, the voice that exceeds or um, is in excess of the constraining uh, sort of apparatus more present. I've removed type uh, in between printing each page in order to make Marion Waters uh, sort of the own position more legible uh, within the notice. Um, so there's a, a quick time lapse of me removing type and putting in spacing between uh, each page. Uh, and so what you have then um, is this artist book that as you flip through the book, the text slowly uh, washes away. I wanted it to look like a wave sort of moving across the page. And you're left with uh, the phrase, Mary Ann Waters is a free black woman. And there are some moments, uh, if you can catch them, uh, for instance, the original ad says, um, calls himself Marianne Waters, and I change himself to herself, H I R, which is a gender neutral uh, pronoun that then changes to herself. And then also, uh, black doesn't actually appear and has to be uh, moved and sort of reassembled. Uh, in the right place in order to uh, further articulate um, sort of how, as I understand it, how Mary Ann Waters under, understood herself um, in that moment and sort of tries to um, offer a different story than what the pickup, uh, what the pickup notice offers. Um, so I will, I'll end it there. Um, I do just want to give a special thank you to uh, Cynthia Sears and um, Catherine Michaels and Tia Blassingame all for in, um, making it possible for my work to be in Bina's collections. And there's uh, information about my email and my Instagram and my shop if people are interested. So I will stop share and, and hand it over. Thank you so much, Caden. That was incredible, really incredible. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Kitty Koppelman again. Um, I was introduced to Kitty's work years before I met her when I moved to Olympia. I was buying her celebratory cards at my local food co-op and saw her screen printed t-shirts about town that showed two people with sledgehammers hammering away at an outline of the United States and reads white supremacy white people's work. I'm wearing my t-shirt now. Um, getting involved with Olympia's print community eventually brought me to Kitty herself. 
Her print work spans a broad range from portraits of people and plants, both important in her community, queer lives, especially queer youth, anti-racist work, and words and pictures that capture the experiences of the pandemic, like an image of two people embracing and the words, I hug you. But I have to mention one of my favorites is a crying baby and the words, patriarchy breaks my heart. Kitty does it all. She's a teacher, mentor, and friend. Thank you for being here tonight, Kitty. Take it away. Does it all, huh? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Catherine. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am Kitty Koppelman, and I'm a printmaker uh, living and working on the ancestral land of the Stashas Band of the Squaxin Island and Nisqually Indian tribes, um, now known as Olympia. Um, let me figure out how to share my screen here. There we go. Okay. Um, this print is probably the image that best encapsulates my work and meaning. My focus in my work is to try to see things as they really are and to try to set aside what, I'm, what I think I'm seeing and what I think I know so that I can find the bare truth of what's in front of me. This is always a challenge when I'm drawing. Learning to draw is actually learning to see and drawing and image making helps me to redirect my brain to see the truth of what's really there, not just what I think is there. This process actually extends far beyond making art. There's a constant presence of smoke and mirrors churning all around that keeps us from seeing the real and devastating consequences of greed and capitalism, the wealth gap, systemic racism, patriarchal bullshit that's just taken for granted, the gender binary that's just taken for granted, and so on and so on and so on. So I've been focusing on trying to cut through those stories and myths and labels in an attempt to understand who I am and who I want to be and to see how we're all built in spite of how I've learned to think and see things. So cutting the crap is kind of, I guess, my uh, mission. So um, Catherine asked me to share my pastel work. So um, in 1999, I took a pastel class at the community college and I was around 40 years old and hadn't really done much art since then, but the class totally changed me. Um, I fell completely in love with the depth of color, the physical feel of the chalk and learning to draw. And that was all just my breakfast. So I just, you know, drew what I saw and I love breakfast. So that was one of my favorites. So I started out painting mostly still lifes, portraits of ordinary objects that I thought were interesting to stare at. Then I took the leap and started doing portraits. I have a lot of slides, so I have to pace myself here. Tell me if I'm going too fast, okay. These are all pastels. I love the natural world around me. And this was, I think my one and only landscape that I did. So I started doing portraits, mostly old family photos, friends and selfies. That's my grandma, that was my mom back here, my grandma, my great grandmother and her closest friend, Anna from Troy, my nephew, niece, good friend of mine, and another friend, and another friend, and my mom, So in 2012, I saw that a friend of mine had some block print supplies and I got curious and tried them out. 
I really loved the way the carved images looked. But the thing that I loved the most about block printing was how I could make dozens of prints and then just give them away to people with abandon. This wasn't possible with pastels. They're um, just really fragile. They have to be framed behind glass and a special mat so that the, the chalk doesn't fall off the paper. And, um, you know, they're just sort of precious and fussy. And I just carried prints around with me and handed them out. And it was just really fun. Um, it seemed like when I would hand somebody a handmade thing, there would be, you know, you get like sort of this emotional reaction from people that you're giving them something of yourself. That's really different than printing something from, you know, a, a computer or, or a, you know, something that, that is, hasn't been touched by human hands. So I was making single color prints for a while, but I really missed the intense color of pastels. So um, I went to the library to look at some books on block printing, and that's when I learned about reduction prints. Um, this is a process where you can print multiple colors from a single block. Here's an example. You line up the paper and the block to print exactly in the same place and gradually carve away and print layers of color over what was printed last. And eventually all the stuff of the block is color. Here's another example. So I started making reduction prints of old family photos, friends and selfies and others. And they started to get more and more colorful and complicated. That was my dad and this is a niece, another niece, my grandma and my aunt, my godson, my grandma's sister, the donkey friend, Mucha. I got to spend some time in Hawaii and got inspired for prints there. Um, so in 2016, I learned about Community Print, which is a member-run community-supported letterpress studio that's been operating in Olympia since the 90s. And as a side note, uh, Community Print lost its home in a fire in December and um, is working on recovering from that right now. At Community Print, I found out about movable type and presses. Up until then, my only press was a marble rolling pin. My first project at Community Print combined a small lino cut block with type. Before that, I hadn't ever considered putting words inside the frame of my images. But I started to see that the combination of the two were so much more meaningful than the sum of their parts. And this was my first um, letterpress project at Community Print. And this was the next one. And then this one, um, Catherine started telling you about. So adding words to the image. I made this broadside in 2016 after hearing for the first time about Black Lives Matter. I was dumbstruck by the absurd and hideous irony that black people had to be the ones to make such a statement. This realization got me sucker punched, kind of kicked in the head, which I needed and I'm grateful for it. So this image with these words were an attempt to put the onus on myself to take responsibility for the effects of my own privilege some acknowledgement that I'm the constant and lifelong beneficiary of the injustice of white supremacy, as are all my fellow white people. My hope was that this simple statement could help us fragile, scared, and embarrassed white folks to start talking about the truth that we've become so comfortable ignoring for so long, all at the expense of black lives and people of color. Here's another uh, version.
so I started to give away the white people's work broadside and it was so popular that I started to make it, decided to make it into a t-shirt. So I made a screen and I went to the local thrift store and bought all the blank t-shirts I could find and started printing them and giving them away to anyone who would wear one. This then became a routine for me. Every Tuesday I go to Valley Village and snap up all their blank shirts because it's 30% off for seniors on Tuesdays. And, uh, and every few weeks I'd print up a hundred or so of them and I'd had them out at craft fairs. And this is a, I got really fast at it after a while. This is, this is in real time. Not really. Um, I estimate that I gave away more than 2000 shirts. I also sold them on Etsy at cost. This was the only kind of shirt that I wore for about a year. It led to some really great conversations and also some really ugly ones. Last spring after George Floyd's murder, the shirt sales on Etsy went through the roof for about 10 days. And I actually had to buy new shirts in order to print or to, to print in order to fill all the requests. I had really mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, it was great that so many white people, I'm assuming they were white, um, wanted to wear the shirt. But on the other hand, here was the legacy of my people. What do white people do when we're uncomfortable? We shop. So it started to feel like wearing the shirt was this performative act rather than actually doing the work of being anti-racist. Some people told me that they'd only wear it to protest because they didn't want to get into arguments. I'm sure that's not everyone's feeling and that's not why you're wearing it tonight, Catherine. <laughs> um, but in any case, I stopped making them last summer, um, but I do still give away the broadsides at art markets and I still print thousands of them and, and people are really into them. Um, and it's, it's just always great to see positive reactions to them. It just helps me sort of, you know, go forward knowing that there are people that get it um, and that I can give them a gift also. So I officially opened a business in 2017 and I call it Start Something Goods. I sell my prints and I make banners that have screen print versions of lino cut images. And I also make small canvas bags. This is my sewing machine. But this is sort of my theme of starting something. There's one many ways to start things. different versions of the banners. So with my ladder press and lino cut, I think what's so compelling is that there's some kind of special alchemy when you combine solid, specific, concise words with a rougher handmade image. It's like the image has the kiss of humanity and the words are more mechanical and solid. Like complementary colors, they complete each other and they command more attention and consideration together than either could separately. Here's the one Catherine was talking about. Here's a pride print. I get inspired by nature a lot. That's Mount St. Helens, my neighbor. Um, last summer, two summers ago, I, was, uh, I learned about fig wasps. And if you've never heard of a fig wasp and you don't know how figs are pollinated, check it out. It's incredible. And it inspired this print that I made. So 
I like to make queer art that's positive and affirming. And if anybody ever said printmakers don't make a lot of money, forget it. You can make all the money you want. This is my $3 bill. And this is um, a, a friend of mine has some uh, non-binary kids and she shared my art with them. And this is like my favorite photo of my artwork that I've ever seen. They, they were so happy to receive it. And I was really happy to get this photo. Love it. So I, I also have just done some more selfies. This was a portrait commission. Thank you, Catherine. This is the pandemic print, made a few pandemic prints when things were really dire and people thought we were doomed forever. Everything was so awful, remember? Um, this winter, I got inspired by this book that was put out by um, the uh, Northwest Indian Treatment Center and Grub. Uh, they're both, uh, well, one's a recovery center and the other is a youth food education organization. And they put out this book about local native plants. And I got inspired to make some prints. My favorites. This is, this is, I think this is the last print I made. Um, and I just wanted to say finally that uh, as a printmaker, one of the things that's been so amazing is how encouraged I've been by the rest of the printmaking community. It's just, it was just amazing to discover how supportive it just feels totally different than the capital A art community, um, which I've also, I've always sort of felt on the outside of, um, but people are so eager to share resources, presses, prints, stories, ideas, techniques. And um, I'm just really grateful. And I wanna shout out to Kelsey, Jamie, Hukey, Catherine and Bill. Um, it's, it's just so great to, feel like I'm a part of something bigger than just, you know, I spent so much time alone making things to know that there's, um, you know, I'm part of uh, something bigger than that is really wonderful. And I'm really excited to reciprocate. And that's all I got. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow, pretty. That was everything. Okay, um, we're gonna move on now to last but not least, Ben Blunt. I first came to know Ben's work through the book Print Artist Scholar of Color Collective Membership List. I think it was right before the pandemic hit, but I can't be sure. I went to Ben's website and was immediately mourning that so many of his artist books were out of print. They are each profound works, many directly calling out white supremacy and racism in the United States. I started attending Zoom events where Ben was presenting to better get to know his work. What I remember, whether it's true or not, were that those first talks I attended opened with him sharing a broadside he printed at the beginning of the pandemic that read, let's get through this together. After all, we're neighbors. Ben's neighborhood is a stark contrast to mine. His kindness tangible in his broadside posted on his door and gifted around his neighborhood. He made me think about how I could do better in my neighborhood. Across Ben's work is a strong sense of community across communities. Fierce, ironic, 
humorous, insistent. His voice, his print work, his neighborliness is something to learn by. Thank you for being here tonight, Ben. Take it away. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really nice. It was nice to go last because I got to see <coughs> Kate and Kitty's work and like just so inspired. And like when you go to the museum and you see all the work and you just want to go home and make something. That's why I feel like you guys are giving me so much, I don't know, good ideas. And uh, I also love breakfast. I also love Cooper Black. So we have a lot <laughs> in common. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, as Catherine said, my name is Ben. Uh, I'm an artist and printer, and I live just north of Chicago in Evanston. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. And again, like really just hearing the words and seeing, seeing the work of Kitty and Kaden. And yeah, I'm just excited to be, be a part of this. At one point, we were going to be there in person, uh, which I think would have been fantastic. Uh, I was, yeah, I've never been to the West Coast in that way. So I was excited, but it's good that more people can join and we can be together in this way. And then I was looking through the events of um, Dog Ear Festival. And then I saw that Amos was gonna be there. And I'm like, you guys are gonna have so much fun. Amos is, uh, everyone loves Amos. He's a great printer. I took a few workshops from him over the years and I took one, maybe my second year in grad school and it really kind of changed the trajectory of, of my work. So. Hello to Amos Kennedy. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'll click through a few pieces and then show three or four pieces where I go into a little more depth. Um, my work talks about um, race a lot, also uh, culture. Uh, sometimes politics, um, interested in identity, language, and history. Uh, I typically work with wood and sometimes metal type. Um, and I usually uh, just use the, the type in my collection. So I don't make a lot of plates or do a lot of carving. I like to just kind of work and try to be creative within those restrictions. And so uh, I show this image to share kind of how I work. I'll have a general idea of what I want to do or what I want to say. And I might make a preliminary sketch, but I don't usually have it figured out before I start. I'll just grab a sheet of paper, grab some start, type, and start uh, composing on the sheet of paper to see how things kind of uh, work themselves out. And so to get this message to fill in the page, I started combining uh, bigger type with smaller type to make everything um, big and bold, but still fit on the page. Um, so this is me setting the, the first run of this print. So I've gotten the first print, so I'm laying over the type for the second run on top just to make sure everything fits all right. Um, and then this is the series. So this is from Juneteenth a few years ago. Juneteenth is coming up in a couple more weeks. And so, of course, a couple of years ago, um, uh, George Floyd just got murdered, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Um, so knees off our necks is specifically uh, a nod to George Floyd. And just every other day, it seemed like we were seeing this um, video footage and hearing news reports of uh, police violence and black people getting killed. So um, the initial poster was stop killing black people. Um, last year was the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. Uh, and so I wanted to do a poster to commem commemorate that. If you're unaware, um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a neighborhood called Black Wall Street. It was this thriving business district. Uh, lots of Black businesses and Black entrepreneurs. And as how these things often happen, there's a story of a Black man maybe doing something untoward towards a white woman. Uh, the white people in the town tried to grab this young man and, and murder and lynch him. And in this instance, the Black people came to the, uh, the jailhouse to try to stop them. Um, there was a small 
kind of fight ensued. And then the next day, the white people basically came in and murdered and burned down the whole town. And so uh, there is a personal connection for this. So my great aunt uh, actually lived in Tulsa at the time. So she's a survivor of this event. Uh, she was eight years old at the time and can remember being woken up in the middle of the night and, and told to like, let's get out of the house, we have to go. They're burning our homes. And so they went up into the hills for safety and she could look down and see the houses in the town uh, being burned. Um, their house was spared, uh, but the next day she does remember um, the light glinting off the bayonets from the National Guard as they were coming in to kind of squash what was happening. Uh, so I wanted this, uh, I wanted the dates to be big and bold. Um, there's a gold shape in the middle, of that, middle that's taken from the, the Oklahoma flag. Um, but I didn't want it to be completely celebratory. So in that big apostrophe, there's information about the aftermath of this massacre, uh, just in case people didn't know and to be kind of informative. And so these numbers are estimates, of course, uh, between one and 300 people dead, 10,000 people homeless, 1,200 homes burned. 215 businesses looted and $200 million of destroyed property value. Um, again, as Black Lives Matter was, was rising and we're having this conversation about white supremacy and white privilege and uh, systemic racism and, and what does this mean? And um, people were posting black squares on uh, Instagram. Um, just thinking about what is white supremacy and and how does it show up and, and how does it feel in, in the world? So I decided to just make a series of posters. I made a list thinking about what I felt like white supremacy is. I asked friends to give me words. And so I, I started printing posters talking about white supremacy. Uh, and I have them grouped in threes. White supremacy is traumatic, devastating, exhausting. White supremacy is cultivate, uh, calculated, intentional, nurtured. Laughable, idiotic, asinine, trending, all the rage, and the new black. So there's uh, 18 different posters all together. Uh, and this is such a, a big idea that was interestingly enough, a new idea to a lot of people. I wanted to, this to have a large impact. So I printed uh, lots of copies of this poster and this iteration was installed at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts. Uh, the center was closed at the time, so we uh, posted the posters outward facing on the windows. So if you were across the street, um, so I wanted to have this big kind of massive, uh, almost mil billboard or, or mural effect. So there's over 150 posters uh, of these 18 phrases uh, printed in multiples. And then of course, if you're on that side of the street, you could take in the individual messages and, and read them and see how they make you feel. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you even say, know what this person is talking about? And that uh, blank print that I showed up front where it says white supremacy is and there's blank is there to have the viewer kind of fill in the blank with their own idea of white supremacy if they have thought about it before or if they have a different word. And people have sent me, you know, Instagram me words or uh, given suggestions for. Uh, things I should put for white supremacy. So it, it became kind of an, an interactive piece, which is cool. Uh, it was cool about the timing of this. So we had planned to do this show uh, kind of in the summer, um, but we kept pushing it back, pushing it back, back, and it ended up going up in January, almost, I think it was the day after the insurrection at the Capitol. So it felt like it was a kind of immediate response to um, what was happening in DC. I wasn't there to install it, but the people that were installing it said that as they're putting the posters up, people are driving by and talking to their horns and like giving support for it. So it was uh, just made it feel even more timely, even this is kind of a, a perpetual issue in the States. I uh, found this image of the I am a man of poster and that's kind of the, the, the feeling that I wanted. So. This is from the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. And so just seeing uh, multiples of uh, the same like simple declarative statement, just ink on paper, just showing how the power of print can amplify these voices and they're kind of standing in solidarity. It just has this massive effect. 
uh, this next piece, I've, I've shown it a few times because one, I like it, but also it started out as a poster that kind of turned into a book, which I think uh, has not happened very often for me. Sometimes I'll try to decide, does this feel like it should be a book uh, or does a poster make, uh, make more sense? Sometimes it's for timing where I want to get an, a response out quickly that I'll make it a poster. But this one started out as a poster, but also became a book. And it was uh, brought about by something a, a friend overheard at work. Um, this was several years ago. Um, we were at work during Martin Luther King's birthday. We didn't have it off. And my uh, black friend was saying, yeah, why we shouldn't be at work today. We should have this, this day off. And a white coworker uh, said to her, if we had a day off for every time a black man got murdered, we would never go to work. So yeah, first I was just struck how racist and bold that is to say in the office. Uh, uh, and two, just thinking of what to do with it again. Do I, do I make something with this? Do I collect racist things that people have heard of at work and then make a book to show people these things? And I kind of mold it for actually years. Uh, and then I took a more kind of direct route and thought, um, well, you get days off for holidays. And so what if every time a black man got murdered, it was a holiday? So I did some research and looked at uh, every black man in Chicago that was killed in 2016 and took the dates of their death and put it on the 2017 calendar as a holiday. So if you do that, you would get 275 holidays. There are 535 black men killed in Chicago uh, that year. And to get combined their, the dates of their deaths are 275 holidays. So this is a kind of life-size wall calendar. And red dots for uh, each person that was uh, killed. And then to the right, there's a chronological listing of the men's names. There we go. Um, so uh, I show this image to uh, just show the kind of conversations, um, showing this information that we get uh, through other media, through television, or through social media, uh, how it comes to you versus how it might come in this calendar. So this, this, this is my friend's daughter was asking me about the calendar and what these dots are. So I'm explaining to her how the calendar works and just thinking the conversation that we're having is different than she would get if she was uh, watching the latest news report about how the South Side and the West Side of Chicago is so much more violent than the rest of the city kind of humanizing uh, these people's lives. Uh, it turned into a bookish calendar as well. So it's also a page a day calendar. So uh, it's 365 pages and each uh, page of the calendar lists um, the names of the people that died that year. And in August, there was a date where uh, I think eight men were murdered. Uh, this last book I want to show is a more uh, recent uh, book called Wish Book. It was inspired by uh, the Sears Christmas catalog, which is called Wish Book. Um, if you're uh, younger, you might not realize the Sears catalog was this huge 800 page catalog that listed everything. At some point, you could buy, you know, clothes, toys, things from your kitchen, you could even buy a house from it. And so before the internet, this is people would get this and like earmark the pages and look through it of all the stuff that you can get and think about what you want and what you'd wish for. And so I was thinking about what we wish for in America and how different people wish for different things. Uh, the American dream of owning a house and having a car and being debt free and having some money and like how accessible is that really for people? Um, so uh, the book has some quotes in it. I remember circling everything I wanted, but knowing deep down my parents could never afford to buy any of it. What I love about America is not necessarily the American dream, but the fact there's so much spirit of fighting to continue to dream once the dreams are broken. And I'm also combining that with actual statistics and charts um, talking about inequality in um, income, home ownership and education uh, between black and white people. So this chart says the median black family owns just 2% of the wealth of the median white family. 
And this is the richest 25% of school districts spent $1,500 more per student on average than the poorest 25% of districts. So everything is still in this uh, red and green holiday colors. So it's mixing this message of, of wishing and dreaming. And there's a page in the back that came from a real Sears catalog that says, I wish that has a list, I dream, it has a list. So just thinking about what are people wanting? We're talking too about uh, trans rights and queer rights beyond just consumer things. What, are, what do people wish for and really like to have in America that because the system is inherently unequal, everyone uh, cannot have. Uh, so people might have seen this sign before. This is a um, magnet uh, stuck to the, the end of my press. Freedom of the press is limited to those who own one. So I take owning a press uh, really seriously. And so think of it as a, not a responsibility per se, but print is I think uniquely, uh, a uniquely appropriate medium, medium for sharing these stories, getting these messages out. And so being able to print multiple copies, being able to print enough to give away to people, to people that can't afford things, uh, to make them so it's not so expensive, um, to amplify other people's voices, I think is a, is a good use of the printing press. Thanks a lot. I hope you all can hear everyone clapping for you here in the auditorium. Thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. I wanna make that chat go away. I'm trying to fix my screen here. Um, okay, we're gonna start the Q&A portion. And I wanna start with a question first for all of you. Um, you can think about it and then jump in, uh, unmute yourself first. My own activist work has not been constant. My earliest efforts began in protest to the reinstatement of the draft registration in 1980. It's hard work, often discouraging to stay engaged over time. How do you care for yourself? If anybody wants to jump on, go ahead, Kitty. Um, well, for me, making art is taking care of myself. I mean, it's like, you know, making that that crying baby is like, you know, I'm I'm trying to like punch patriarchy in the face with that. And it, that actually is the way that punching would make me feel better is when I'm punching the ink on the paper. <laughs> so, you know, it's like without that, um, you know, outlet, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be sicker, you know, and it, it really helps me to, um, to express it and then also to share it, you know, because that's how we make community is by, you know, um, finding each other through our heart work and through our, you know, what, what we give a shit about, you know, and then you find out that somebody else gives a shit about the same thing that, you know, you sit alone and suffer about, you know, and so that, that's, I mean, absolutely, I feel like I take care of myself by making stuff and you know like i don't i'm not into capitalism but i love going to craft fairs and sharing my work with people you know because because then i i can you know actually interact about it and and hear people respond and it, it just really boosts me up so that's my yeah i was gonna gonna say the same thing there's a quote i like uh the best way to complain is to make things and so when I get like fired up, fired up and riled up, I think I gotta make something about this or I need to say something about this. And so uh, not only is it an outlet, but also uh, it gives me energy. And so when I'm feeling like worn down, I don't necessarily wanna rest. I wanna get up and make something that gives me energy and it's kind of restorative uh, in some ways. And so I feel the same way as Kitty, like being able to make this work is, is restorative. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree, uh, right? Um, you know, it's a way, like it steps, it keeps me, um, it gives me an outlet where I can step away from the sort of like drudgery of graduate school and writing a dissertation. Um, but the, one of the things that I really love um, about printing and letterpress printing and um, all of uh, all of my presses, my Chandler and Price has a treadle and I have a, um, a Washington and Ho iron hand press. They're really fit, like physically um, uh, require some work. And, you know, that's this weird sort of experience of sort of confronting the news uh, and the, the onslaught of anti-trans legislation that is really trying to erase, um, especially trans youth. Uh, that the print shop actually um, requires me to have an embodied experience and to remind me that like I have a body and it is real and it exists in the world and it is legitimate and it is valid. Um, and there, I can't think of anything else that actually forces me to um, have that kind of embodied experience with making. I mean, you know, it, I suppose it's embodied when I'm sitting in my laptop typing away about, you know, Walt Whitman. Uh, but it's not quite the same thing as like kicking the press on a treadle or wheeling the bed under the platen and pulling the arm and just like, or letting my hand go numb uh, while it's holding the composing stick and I'm um, setting type. Um, there, there's, um, it's a, just a constant reminder that I'm like here and present. You have to be present or you lose a finger in the printing press, right? Um, and so there's some, that's just really grounding. Uh, my advisor once asked me or made a comment about whether or not the print shop was a distraction. And my response was, it's the only thing keeping me in graduate school right now. <laughs> so, you know. Oh, I'm so glad. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the Q&A, and then I also want to ask our audience here, Bima, if any of them have a question they want to ask, which we'll relay. Um, the question in the chat is, how would you respond today to the gun violence in America? If anyone has any thoughts. I've been thinking about that, like there's so much stuff with Roe and the gun violence, like, yeah, I've, I feel like I have, yeah, ideas swirling and thinking about what to say. Is there anything for me to say? Like, I, I mean, I lost right now. Like, I, I feel like something building up inside of me, but I'm not really sure what that'll be yet. Same, same here. Uh, so far, my response has been crying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, um, it takes me a while to come to something and I tend to, my first impulse is to go to the archive and see what's there. So, uh, you know, you mentioned the postcards um, that I had been sending during the pandemic and when um, uh, George Floyd was murdered, I wanted to respond, didn't know how to respond, didn't want it to be insincere. And so I, at the time, was reading um, the letters and speeches by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who is a amazing 19th century um, uh, Black writer and act, activist and abolitionist and, and, and preacher at times. And I was reading her letters and she was talking about the sort of um, the, the clarion call of the of the sort of death knell. Um, and so I just printed a, you know, a snippet of text from her, from um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and sent that out um, uh, as my response. So I, you know, I think in this moment, it's for me is going to require sort of something that comes out of the research that I'm doing at the time, um, but what that ends up looking like or how it manifests materially, I don't know, but I'm sure it'll have something to do with the 19th century. Yeah, to be honest, I've kind of been the last month or so trying to avoid 
the news and I just kind of haven't, you know, I hear about it, but I haven't taken in the full story a lot of times. And then I, I work at an ad agency and my boss uh, had us all together and showed a compilation of the way advertising has been uh, responding to gun violence. So just like a dozen anti-gun ads and I'm like bawling at the end of these ads. And so like, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in and figure out, you know, what to do with it. Thank you. Do we have any questions in our audience? Anybody want to raise their hand? If not, we'll move on. I have another one from Q&A. Anyone? Is that a, you're going to, we have yes, a question. We, we have a question from Samuel first in the audience. Go ahead. Um, my, my question will come across for uh, but I want to uh, preface that question uh, with a statement that have inspired all three of your books are. I don't know if anyone can hear Samuel. He's saying that he wants to begin by saying how inspired he is by all of your works. But I'm curious if Caden and Ben arranged to wear flamingo shirts before him. <laughs> but he wants to know if Caden and Ben plan to wear flamingo shirts beforehand. <laughs> okay. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> 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 oh, that was all planned. <laughs> okay, we have a Q&A. The Q&A question was, can you all perhaps talk about what channels you personally use to distribute your prints? Okay, can you all talk about what channels you personally use to distribute your prints? Any order. I'm off mute, so I'm, I'll just go first. Um, I... I post stuff on Instagram and people contact me on Instagram to buy stuff. I've got a website uh, that people can buy, purchase things. And then uh, I got a storefront studio. So even though it's mostly studio, it is a storefront. So people can walk in and say, hey, can I buy something from you? And so kind of off the street stuff. And I do, so I don't do a lot of tabling. Um, our local kind of art community is pretty strong. So we have regular like, first Saturdays in Evanston where studios can be open and we're doing a, actually tomorrow we're doing a studio tour. So I'll be here from 12 to five and people can come and, and buy things. So yeah, in person, I don't do a lot of shows sometimes and then social media type stuff, Insta uh, and website. Um, I, do, I do have an Etsy shop that is really badly maintained. <laughs> And uh, I, I also post on Instagram, but I don't have everything I post on Instagram on Etsy. I'm trying to get those synchronized, but I really suck at that marketing stuff. And I do, um, I do, do craft fairs locally. Um, I'm doing the Pride Festival tomorrow in Olympia. It's supposed to rain, but I have a tent. You could come stand under it with me. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I have a website that links to my Etsy. Uh, I mean, I mostly Instagram and I have a sort of a web shop. Um, I am also not very business oriented. Um, I, don't, I don't do a lot of art fairs. It seems to be word of mouth, but I, a lot of sort of how stuff gets distributed is I hear there's an event and then I just give away posters, especially if it's, if um, youth, trans youth are involved, then I try to get like the IU We Exist posters to, um, uh, to trans youth. I do have work placed um, in the local art shop available. Um, but that is really sort of, um, I, I struggle with getting my work distributed in part because um there it's a sort of like the how do you price things to, to account for the labor and the materials that are involved but i'm trying to make work for the trans community which is disproportionately impoverished and so how do i create work that is financially accessible to them but that allows me to keep my shop open. Um, so one of the things that I actually do that allows me to give away quite a bit of my work is provide virtual um, 
demos on typesetting in the iron hand press for universities that have like book history classes that don't have access to uh, a printing lab on their campus. So a lot of Shakespeare scholars will write me and ask me to give a one hour demo. As part of that demo, I print a keepsake with whatever random Shakespeare quote they're studying, send it off to the class so everyone gets a print from it. Um, and that's um, that that kind of academic work is what makes the sort of activist work uh, possible. Uh, when I was doing postcards, the post I was paying for the paper, postage was um, completely donated by people who were just like Venmoing me cash, and that allowed me to um, send a, a, around 300 postcards, you know, every few weeks. Great. Um, so I'm curious, I want to know what you're looking forward to doing in the next year or so around your print work, but maybe also if there's any topics or themes that um, you haven't done work around. Well, we just talked about the gun violence, but I'm thinking of things that maybe you just don't know how to handle or you don't know what you want to do, but they're sort of cooking in the back of your mind, maybe. You know, sort of the uncharted territory of your yeah. I, I have been thinking about um, doing something on reproductive rights, but I'm. It's definitely um, very early stages of um, thinking about. I'm. I'm not. I'm sort of. Um, mm. You know, like a, what usually happens is I. I will think of an image first, and then find the words to go with. Um, and that crying baby uh, it has like come up in my mind to do something about um, reproductive rights with that baby. <laughs> and I actually, when I made that print, um, I don't know why, but I, I didn't make that baby a reduction print. I actually had two blocks. So it was like, I something inside me knew I was going to use it for something else one day. Um, so that that's sort of, you know, nipping at my heels a little bit. Uh, I've been having thinking about uh, the future and like Afrofuturism kind of time travel, just like all these issues we're dealing with and the language around them, how might that be different in 50 years, 100 years, imagine futures, like, I know some of my work can be pretty direct. And so I think if I move forward in time, I might, uh, I don't know, come across some, some new ideas. Um, I'm, uh, it, as part of my dissertation research, I've been um, learning about extra illustrated volumes in the 19th century, this process of um, collecting prints and adding them into books, often histories and what have you. And I have um, uh, the Newberry Library up in Chicago has an amazing collection of extra illustrated books by this guy, John Wing, who was a gay bibliophile uh, in Chicago and was engaged in extra illustration. And he extra illustrated this um, uh, volume, this book that was on sort of like taboo, sort of taboo things and people. And so there's a chapter on sort of intersex people or hermaphrodites and a chapter on eunuchs. And uh, so I went and found a first edition of this, uh, of this book and I'm working on um, doing my own extra illustrated version of it. I'm still sort of like, don't know what that is going to look like or if I'm going to collect prints or ask other artists to contribute prints or print do prints myself. Um, I haven't quite figured it out, but I know that there's um, something there and something about the process of extra illustration and the kind of self-making um, that Wing is doing at the time and that um, in some way I'm also doing through, through printmaking and bookmaking. Well, I know that we're all going to want to um, 
know what you're doing. So I hope you'll keep us all informed and each other. There's lots of comments of people who are really inspired and loving your presentations. And um, I think we might have time for one more quick question. What are you doing to pass your skills along, both printing skills and using finding your voice? Using printing skills and what, what did you say? Finding your voice. Oh. Well, I've, I've discovered that I love to teach printmaking. Oh, we knew that. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I love to talk about it. And I, you just, I can't shut me up once I start, you know, just, uh, and I love teaching um, carving, you know, and, and, and uh, image, just, you know, working with images and composition. And I'm not very skilled at letterpress, honestly, but, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I can hold my own, but I, I wouldn't make a great teacher, but I love teaching block printing and um, I'm looking forward to doing more of that. Great. I think, uh, yeah, teaching, uh, I've had the opportunity to teach young people sometimes and it's a little bit how to use the press, but it's more about what do you want to say? Like we get to grab this type and put ink on this paper and like, and showing how long it takes to set it up and the process of making it like look right in the way you want it. Like what's worth taking that time? What do you want to say that's important enough to take this time to, to put it on paper? Um, yeah, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have a, a, a storefront so that people could see the process somewhat. So not that everyone who comes in here is going to be a printer, but just um, I think people, uh, like seeing people make stuff, like seeing things handmade. And so maybe that uh, gives them some energy or inspiration to go do their thing, whatever, whatever else it is. Um, so having kind of an open door, so I'll be printing, people can walk by and just come in and say, hey, what are you doing? And check up a conversation. So just kind of making that space for people, I think is, is important. I agree. I think it's great to reveal the process of how things are made. Yeah, I wish my shop was in a slightly more communal space um, so people could just like come in and uh, talk with me about the work. I, I, you know, I'm very lucky at the university that um, this year, a new professor on campus, Ryan Cordell, as part of the Fabrication Lab sort of maker space, has built out um, a letterpress shop uh, to, to teach the, both students at the university um, and the community more broadly. And um, he's uh, brought me on not only to help move the printing presses as some, you know, I always joke about printing presses being like tattoos and once you have one, you just you keep going. Um, and then everyone in town knows that you know how to move a printing press and they, <laughs> they call you up. Uh, and so I'm very lucky that um, uh, Professor Cordell has brought me on as the assistant to sort of help run the letterpress shop and work with the community and students on campus uh, that is available to anyone to use. You don't have to be registered in an art class. Anyone wants to come in and learn how to print something, they can do that and that is uh, my primary way. And then I, um, right before the pandemic, bought a mobile workbench uh, and mounted a, um, a five by eight Kelsey tabletop hand press to it. And I wheel that around campus and take it to like the gender and women's studies picnic and to other events and can teach people how to set type. And then it's there. And I usually have something preset and locked up in the chase. Uh, was some sort of slogan uh, to print. You know, the pandemic ha happened. I was hoping to wheel it around uh, campus and have people print their own, get out the vote postcards. But perhaps, perhaps this this November we do have an election in Illinois happening uh, this November, so we might be doing that. But that's that's one of the ways that I uh, get the work out. That sounds fun. Amazing. I think uh, we're, we're at the end and I wanna thank you all. This has just been incredible, very inspiring and generous of all of you. And um, 
Thank you for kicking off our Dog Ear Weekend celebration here at the museum. And I hope we can bring you back um, or bring you another time, Ben. I hope uh, we'll have you all out. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we can do this again in the future. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your skills and your beautiful work with us. <laughs>